Um, last, um, last Sunday, I talked to you about the church. Um, if you don't have the DVD, you might would like to try to get that. This Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about the model. I was going to ask you to do that. The model church. Um, hey, let's stand. Um, I, I, I didn't ask you once or twice to stand. I'm trying to save some of those older knees. So, um, I want to get you to stand one more time. The book of Acts chapter 9, verse 31. I want you to listen to these, these words. Uh, Deborah, uh, I didn't really tell Deborah altogether. I don't believe what I was going to preach on. But uh, this, this message kind of touches on a little bit of the song that she, that she sung. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. You may be seated. The book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, was written by Luke. Luke was the beloved physician He was also the writer of the gospel uh, according to that of Luke. In other words, this would have been a continuation of that of his writing. Luke was a doctor who joined Paul's party at Troas. It is generally believed that Luke was not a Jew, but he was a Gentile. From the beginning of Acts chapter 1 up to where we have taken our text in Acts chapter 9 verse 31, Luke gives us some history of some very important events. Things that will first, but even though while these things would be first, some of them would not be the last. In chapter 2 we have Pentecost. Peter's first use of the the keys of the kingdom. He preaches the gospel. His first sermon after Pentecost to the Jews. In chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. We are given a written condition of the state of the first church. In chapter 3, there's a first apostolic miracle. The lame man is healed. In chapter 4, there's the first persecution. Preaching in the name of Jesus is forbidden. In chapter 6, we have the first deacons. In chapter 7, we have the first martyr who is Stephen. In chapter 7, we have the first mention of that of Saul, who would eventually become the Apostle Paul. I'll repeat this. There are some events that Luke wrote about that would first, but would not be the last. And this was true with that of persecution. There are five major persecutions in the chapters that I have pointed out to you this morning. In chapter 4, we have the first persecution, which was a verbal threat to Peter and John. Verse 17. But that, that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. In other words, the first persecution was really about all talk. It was just verbal threats. The second persecution was mental, and it was a physical threat to Peter and John. 
in Acts 5 and 18. They laid their hands on the apostles. They put them in the common prison, verse 40. And when they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. There was a third persecution. It started out as a mental threat with Stephen, Acts 6 and 12. They stirred up the people and the, and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. The fourth persecution was the death of Stephen, Acts 7 and 58. They cast him out of the city. They stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. The, first, the fifth persecution was really against the whole church, Acts 8 and 1. Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Enter into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Now the book of Acts chapter 9. There are two important things that I'd like to mention to you this morning. First of all, there's conversion of that of Saul. The conversion of Saul is a great turning point of God's dealing with that of Israel. His whole program for the evangelization of the world depended on this unusual man. Paul's conversion was all of grace. God suddenly interrupted him on his murderous path and by grace transformed him into a new man. But the second thing of importance in this chapter is this, there was a condition of that of the church. Verse 31 again. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. What? A model church. This church was. I'm reminded of our Lord's words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 11. Blessed, happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Then one word in verse 12. He says what? Rejoice. Got a few questions I want to put to you. Have you got people in your family that trouble you? Have you got people in your family that trouble you? Whether you want to admit it or not, you probably got in laws, and if you're like me, you got in laws and you got outlaws. I'll put the question to you again. Have you got people in your family that trouble you? then you know what you need to do? You need to pray for their conversion. Have you got people at the workplace that trouble you? Have you got people at the workplace that trouble you? Then you know what you need to do? You need to pray for their conversion. Should not be, but sometimes is. Have you got people in the church that trouble you? Boy, I got my work cut out for me this morning. But you know what you need to do? You need to pray for their conversion. And if they want to come back and say whatever three of these categories were they already saved, then you need to pray for their sanctification. I'm going to have to give me some amen cards. Pray for their conversion. When you take a good look at the church in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, 
There's been a lot of water that has flowed under the bridge since Pentecost. The church is no longer in the honeymoon stage. But what a model church it was and is. Have you ever made this statement? You need to write this one down. How many would like to see the church full of people? Can I tell you the flip side of that? I would like to see people that are full of the church. I want to tell you about five things about this model, this model church. Here's the first one. The model church is a church of rest. And rest means peace. Because you can't rest unless you got peace. Then had the church, churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. The church was at rest and the church was at peace. How many remembers back in the book of Exodus that Moses goes up the mountain and while he's going up the mountain, he's there for 40 days and 40 nights. And the people said if Moses was going to come back down, he would already have been down. Aaron, you've got to make us some gods. And they broke their golden earrings off. And from that, you know what Aaron did. He made a golden calf. And you remember? They were dancing. They were having their festivities. And Moses hears what's going on along with Joshua. And Joshua thinks maybe that there's war. And Moses says, this is not that of war. And he comes down, and you remember he breaks the commandments. Cast them upon the water, grinds them the powder, casts them upon the water, makes the people to drink. Boy, that's a bad situation, right? And you remember what Moses' prayer was. God, you need to forgive these people of their sins. And if you can't forgive them their sins then blot my name out of the book that you have written. And so, they're going to resume their travel. But Moses begins to pray. And God begins to answer. Aren't you glad that when you pray that we have got a God that can answer us? Amen. Yes. And Joy's going to pull up a particular verse of Scripture of what God said to Moses, my presence is going to go with thee. And I am going to give thee rest. As you journey, don't worry. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to be with you. And you can be at rest. And you can be at peace. Can I tell you, if you got Jesus Christ this morning in your heart and your life, knowing everything that's going on throughout the world, while the world is in turmoil, and the question is, what is next? That we can have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And just as much as the church is, the church right here in the midst of everything that it was going on, yet it had rest. Why? Because of the presence of God that was in their midst. In the Psalm of David, this is very familiar, in 23, there is the trilogy 
uh, of the Psalms 22, 23, and 24. But look at Psalms 23 and 2 real good. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. In verse 1 of the Psalm, we find the satisfaction. In verse 2, we find serenity. In verse 3, we find strength. In verse 4, we find safety. In verse 5, we find sustenance. In verse 6, we find security. But go back to verse 2. Serenity. Serenity is, is that of peace and calmness and, and perfectly clear rest. God says, I am the shepherd and you are my sheep and I will feed you and I will lead you into a place and guide you the green pastures, the still waters that you can find peace and you can find rest. Then there's the message of Jesus. He's telling here not about the kingdom but really about personal discipleship. Jesus has been rejected by Israel and now he offers rest and service to them whosoever will. Matthew 11 and 28. Come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. You remember the apostles in, were sent out in Mark 6 and 30. They were sent out preaching, and now they're returning. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Verse 31. He says unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. The story is told about two woodsmen one woodsman was very older. He was an older woodsman. One was very young. And so the older woodsman decides that he would challenge the young woodsman to a chopping contest. And the young looks at the old and says, you know what, this is going to be a piece of cake. I can take him. And boy, he goes to it, chopping. And sweat's running from his brow. And lunch comes, he eats his food in a hurry. And it goes back chopping. And at the end of the day, he says, Jonathan, I'm going to take this. But he goes back and reflects, and he notices that the old woodsman seemed to be taking breaks. He took a nice lunch. And when the tallied all up, the old woodsman had cut more than the young. And the young woodsman was very annoyed. How in the world, you being older, you taking your breaks, I'm working myself to death, and you have done more work and cut more wood than I have. And he said, son, what you failed to see was that when I sit down, I was sharpening my axe. That's supposed to mean something. Here is a church going through persecution after persecution after persecution after persecution. Verbally, they're threatened. Physically, they're threatened. They're even being put to death. But here, the model church, the Bible says that the churches in these areas, they were at rest. They were at peace. 
My brother, my sister, if you cannot come to the house of God and find rest and find peace, where in the world are you going to find it? But I'm here to serve notice on you. You can find peace in that of Jesus because Isaiah said that he is the prince of peace. So when all around you, when people are giving you trouble in your family and people are giving you trouble at the workplace, when people are even giving you trouble at the church, you can still be at peace and be at rest. How many this morning have you got that peace? And have you got that rest? You know what I'm saying about the storms and the earthquakes? God, when are you going to be satisfied? God, when are you going to be satisfied? Can I throw this out? I'm going to start meddling a little bit. Have we forgot all about the abortions that we've had? Have we forgot about the mixed up lifestyles that people are living now? And once these things started, which they have, I'm questioning where they're going to be in. But you know what, y'all? The church can be at rest. And the church can be at peace. Here's the second thing. The model church is a church not only is at rest and peace, but it is edified. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and listen, and were edified. Do you know what really edified means? It means to instruct, to promote intellectual improvement, enlightenment. I like that, don't you? Three things I want to mention here. The church was built up in the faith. The impotent disciples, you remember that? The mighty Christ, the Father, Son, with the dumb spirit. Mark 9 and 23, Jesus said unto him, this is to the Father, if thou can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Verse 24, Lord, I believe, help them by unbelief. Jesus in the instructions of forgiveness under that category. In Luke 17 and 5, the apostle said unto the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. Jude tells us this, just one chapter in verse 20. He says, ye, beloved, build up yourselves in the most holy faith. You see those churches that are going through persecution here left and right, but they will be edified, and they will be edified in that of the faith. Deborah's lesson this morning was about Noah and how Noah preached for 120 years. And outside his family, he really didn't get anybody saved. And I can see the adversary, the enemy, the devil taking that and using that may be possible against Noah. But you know what? Noah done a very lot of good. Even though he preached for 120 years. He got his family saved. I'll tell you one thing. If you can get your family saved, y'all, that's a big deal. He spared the human race from, from being completely destroyed. He also, because of his faith and his grace, eventually the Messiah could be born. My point is, y'all, don't let the enemy trick you and tell you you ain't doing a whole lot of good. What's the use? Won't you just throw in the towel? Only when we get to heaven are we going to really know altogether the completeness and the fullness of what we had done down here for the Lord. And I got got a feeling it's going to be a lot more than the devil wants to give you credit for. Can somebody say amen to that? They built up their faith. They were edified. 
They were strengthened in the word. A Psalm of David, 119 and 105 in Psalms. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and it's a light unto my path. The path of a good soldier in the time of apostasy. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. After the first deacons in Acts 6 and 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests, it says, were obedient to that of the faith. The church was edified. They were at rest. They were at peace. They were growing in that of faith. They were growing and increasing in strength in the word of God. But how about this? They were rooted in love. Ephesians 3 and 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love. So this model church was at rest. They were at peace. They were being edified. They were growing in that of faith. They were increasing in that of strength in the word. They were rooted in love. Here's the third thing. The model church is a church that is active. Verse 31 again. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking. They were not sitting back to sleep. Can anybody sleep this morning? They were not just sitting back speculating. The Bible says that they were walking. I like that vision that Isaiah has to the people of God in Isaiah 40 and 31. Here's what he says. But they that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall what? Run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Y'all, we don't, we don't mount up with wings as eagles all the time. We do on occasions. On occasions we may run. But the odds are and the average is we're going to walk. But can I ask you a question? What is wrong with walking? What is wrong with walking? There are two antediluvians of who it is said that walked with God. Enoch and Noah. First of all, Enoch. Genesis 5 and 22. Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Can I tell you that Enoch's name means self-surrendered, and it means fellowship, perseverance, progress, preach of righteousness, faith, progress. Go back to progress again. If you're walking, you know what you're doing? What? Making progress. How about this? You're gaining ground. He walked with God for 300 years. Can I tell you that he was a lot farther down the road 
at the end of the 300 years than he was in the beginning. It don't say he was mounting up with wings as eagles. It don't say he was running. It just say that he walked with God. The church was walking. It was active. Not sleeping, not sitting, but walking. Walking with God. And then there's, there's Noah. He was the other one. It also says about Noah. These are, are the generations of Noah. Noah is a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Jesus comes to Capernaum. And he begins his public ministry. Do you know what Jesus is doing? He's doing what? He's walking. He walks by the Sea of Galilee and he sees two brothers there as he's walking. You remember who they were? Who? Peter, Andrew, later, James, and John. But my point is, y'all, he is walking. Matter of fact, there's a lot of verbs that can be used to describe Jesus. Not only was Jesus Christ walking, but here's some more words that surround the story. He's walking, he's going, he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. So let's go back and look at these three things. The model church is a church that can be at rest and can be at what? Peace. It's a church that is also edified, that, that is instructed and promoting and, and being enlightened in that of the, in that of the faith and, and in that of the word and that of love. And it's also a church that's active. But here's something else that's very important. Here's the fourth thing. It's walking in two things. In the fear of of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I went back to these chapters, to chapter 1, to chapter 9, and I, I pulled out some words and people that the early church was encountering. Anybody like to hear who they, they were? They encountered the high priest. They encountered the priest that was under the high priest. They encountered the Sanhedrin. They encountered the council. They encountered the elders. Y'all didn't get that. They encountered the captain of the temple. They encountered the Pharisees. They encountered the Sadducees. There were others. They were verbally abused. They were mentally abused, physically abused, and even put to death. But you got to listen to this. But they were not afraid of man. They were walking in the fear of that of God. Not afraid of the high priest. Not afraid of the priest. Priest, not afraid of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the council, the elders, the rulers, the captain of the temple. It don't say, John, that they were afraid of them. It says they were walking in the fear of the Lord. Not afraid of man, but afraid of God. Solomon's instruction and exhortation to the sons, Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of that of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon's warning and instruction in Proverbs 29 and 25. The fear of man 
bringeth a snare. The 12 is going to be sent forth in Matthew 10 and 28. Fear not. Here's what Jesus said. Fear not them which kill, uh, uh, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather feel he, fear him which is able to destroy both soul, he says, and body in hell. When I was about 17 or 18 years old, And I've may mention this before, but of course I've been here going on 21 years. I mentioned on occasion. I had a friend of mine from Doodle Hill, North Carolina. Jim, we had gone out to the creek out in out in the country and going out to gig some fish, and it was hot and it was in the summer. I don't know where gigging fish was illegal or not. But we were doing some other stuff that was illegal, so the fish was a minor thing. But we got out of the car, and what do you know? We heard a, we heard a, we heard a, heard a rustle in the bushes, and a man, a grown man, crawls out on all fours and had been shot and was bloody all over. And you could stick your fist in his back. And what do you know? Look back up the road. Saw a car back out. Knew the guy. Thought we'd get some help coming. What do you know? Jump out with a shotgun. Shot my friend that I was with. And I ran through the woods. No shirt on. I was showing my physique off in those days. You know, looked like a bean pole with hair, a mop. But I prayed and I prayed, God, you got to deliver me from this. Boy, that's tough for a 16-year-old, 17-year-old. And later I got saved when I was 20 years old. And y'all, that is a scripture that I stood on. Do not fear the one that can destroy the body, but fear the one that can destroy the body and destroy the soul into a devil's hell. You know what's partly wrong with this world? They no longer fear God. Amen. They no longer fear God. And Solomon said that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, of wisdom. If people really feared God, There'll be a whole lot more people in our churches than what are. I remember, and I'm, I'm getting off a little bit, but I remember when I was in Snow Hill, the first desert storm. Y'all remember that? Young people and other people began to come to the church because they didn't know what in the world was going to go on. They were afraid. They were afraid because of the end times. And you know what? Look, just for an example, look right now. We pick up the paper. There's a 6.1, another, another earthquake in Mexico. What, Texas has been hit by storm. Florida's been hit by storm. And you know what? If God wants to, all he's got to do is blow his breath and blow it right on us if he desires. Amen. And then what? California's about to burn to death. Where in the world do you go? This church was not scared of high priests or priests or councils or people in authority, Jonathan. They were afraid of God. And you know what? We are so afraid today of government and government leaders and people that we are scared to say anything. I am getting off. Deborah has a dream one night. Was it in church here? Did it take place here? Well, let's say here. She said, yes. I may have been standing about right here. And you know what? I was being accused because of what I preached and what I believed. And I was on trial. And I was there by myself. And Deborah says, this ain't right. Because I believe the same thing that he believes. 
And you know what? She got up and she stood with me. And my older son comes up and he stands with me. And my daughter, she'll be 40, I hope she don't hear this. Uh, she'll be, be 40 very soon. She comes up and stands. And they begin, they begin to come throughout the whole church. I hope and pray. Joy McElroy was one of them, and others begin to come. I'm going to tell you one thing, y'all. We had better stop being afraid of people. I got off a little bit. But they were walking in the fear of God. But that ain't all they were walking in. They were walking in the comfort of that, of the Holy Ghost. Jesus says, I'm going back to the Father. But you know what he says? If I go back to the Father, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send somebody your way. He's going to be the third person of the, of the Godhead. He's going to be equivalent with that of the Trinity, of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. He is a comforter. He's going to come, and He's going to be in you and along beside you. And when things come your way, and it wouldn't look like this world going down to hell in a basket whatever that means he's going to be in you and be with you and he's going to comfort you and be with you forever and forever I tell you one thing y'all that sounds like a model church to me Amen. Yes. can I tell you that the Holy Ghost is more than just speaking in tongues and just, just more than just a feel-good thing. It's a lot more to Him than that. He gives you power to witness to people and stand right in their face and testify and give you the words to say and the words to speak. And when things come your way, you ain't no different to some degree out of the world. You're going to have troubles and you're going to have problems, but He will comfort your heart and comfort your soul. And they were walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and the fear of God. I don't know where she pulled it up, but I'm going to read it. You remember where Jesus says, blessed are they that mourn? He said, they shall be comforted. You remember the promise of the Spirit in John 14 and 16? I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, one called alongside you to help you. And here's the fifth thing. The model church is a church that multiplies. Here's these words at the beginning. You can pick them out. She's going to pull up verse 31, and you can see it at the end. You can pick these words out of this verse. Then the churches were multiplied. The model church grows and increases because the Holy One is in their midst. We honor His name. Can I say we honor His name? Can we say that his name shall be called Jesus and he shall save his people from their sin? Can we say that there's no other name given in heaven that men can be saved only through the name of Jesus? Can we say that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord and not only is Lord but he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings and this church was holding up the name of that of Jesus but that ain't all. They were believing that of the word. And that ain't all. They were carrying out his will. Amen. Did you know that the, the church started with 120 chartered members? Did you know the Lord added immediately 3,000 to bring the total up to 3,120, Acts 2 and 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 has this, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But you know what? After the first persecution, if you look at Acts 4 and 4, How be it many of them which heard the word believed? And the number of the men was about 5,000. Let me pause just for a minute. I was good in math. 
My mind's getting feeble now. I'm getting 62 years old. I made, I made, I made A's, straight A's, 9, 10, 11, 12th grades, straight A's. Got exempt. Y'all didn't know that about me, did you? Holly had a 99 average in calculus in high school. Does that tell you anything? You probably don't even know what some of your calculus is. Some of you may, some of you may not. But can I tell you in dealing with math, there's subtraction. Can I tell you there's division? Can I tell you there's adding? And can I tell you there's multiplication? Can I tell you when it comes to church, we don't want to be subtracting. And we definitely don't want to be dividing. There's a lot of churches involved in that. And, and you know what? Adding's pretty good. But I'll tell you one thing. Multiplying is a whole lot better. A four plus four is eight, right? Ain't that right? Four plus four is eight. David's looking at me, he ain't for sure, but she is. Four times four, 16. Five plus five. Tell him this, but five times 25, five times five is 25. You know what? You get a whole lot more done when there's not adding going on but multiplying going on. I'm bringing it to an end. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. After they got the first deacons, listen to this, or around the time they were getting ready to get the first deacons, right before, Acts 6 and 1. In those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, verse 7, the word of God increased and the number of the deacons multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Paul's going to return back to Tarsus after his conversion. Then the churches will multiply. But I got one more number I want to give you. That's, I like it. You know what that number is? Does anybody want to know? Zero. Does anybody like to know why that number's important to me? If you ask me, I'll tell you. There were zero denominations in the first century. There are approximately 41,000 today Christian denominations throughout the world. But in the first century, back then they didn't go and say, what church are you a member of? Oh, I'm a member of the Pentecostal Holiness. They were just all known as believers and later would be known as Christians. I like that. Don't y'all like that? Let's see. I'm going to say something to see if anybody knows what I'm talking about. See if this rings a bell. It was the best of times. Y'all are a smart crowd. I can see that those brains of yours, Dolores. Just it was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. Y'all didn't think I knew that, did you? Who? Who? I'm not doing an owl here. Charles Dickens wrote a novel called. Tale of Two Cities. And that's how he begins his novel. Something down those lines. It was the best of times. And it was the worst of times. Can I tell you all this? Right now, there's a lot going on. And you know what? To some, it can be the worst of times. But on the other hand, it's the best of times. You see, y'all, it was the worst of times for the church. But on the other hand, it was the best of times for the church as well. Jonathan, ain't that pretty good preaching? I remember my uncle. Y'all got people like this. Years and years and years ago, I was real. Ronnie, this is on my mama's side. These are the good old days. Billy, them good old days, the houses was not under pin. You could look through the floor and you could see the chicken scratching. 
You could wake up in the winter and have an inch or two inches of snow on the bed. Y'all remember that? He said, that's the, what, not quite that bad? Well, Billy, we were poorer than what y'all were. And he said, that's the good old times. And just the Lord just dropped something then in my young heart. And you, he said, you kind of need to reply to your uncle. And, 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 and I said this. I said, uncle, I said, we're going to look 10 years, 20 years up the road for where we are right now. And we're going to say, you know what? That was the good old years. You know what I'm trying to tell you, y'all? Everything that's going on, these are still the good old days. Won't you, st- won't you stand, please?